So you'll see there's a CPR logo on this. Um, in the very near future, it's going to have an Ashoka logo. I'm, I'm in the process of transitioning over to Ashoka, um, which is why I'm, I'm, I'm presenting today. Um, what I wanted to talk about today um, is a huge data gap that we face when we're studying India. India is actually the most quickly urbanizing region in the world. It will introduce the most urban citizens in India over the next 30 years. And yet, we don't have the most basic information, an unemployment rate, an economic growth rate, economic distribution at the level of the city. It's just something we don't have enough data for. Something that you have a lot of data about in the West, but we know nothing about in India. And so, I would like to speak today about a project that I've been running in and around Delhi, what we call the National Capital Region. The National Capital Region is not just Delhi, but it is the area all around Delhi. We're in it right now. It reaches out towards Rajasthan, out to Meerut. It's a huge area. It is approximately 30 million people. It is the largest urban agglomeration in India, and that's only in 2011. It's growing at 20% per decade, so it's probably a lot more now. And I'm going to be talking today about uh, a survey I ran of about 5,500 households across this region. Only about 60% of that landmass is Delhi, 40% of it is outside and spread across these three states. So this is, you know, broadly the sample that we were able to draw. And you can see that in around Delhi, it's, it, it's quite spread. When I take a little bit of a bird's eye view out, you can see there's a huge cluster of population in Delhi. And there are these small little urban clusters that are around Delhi. And what's going on is the city is essentially filling in. The reason why there's a bunch of blank space between those clusters is that there's villages there. Those villages are slowly being filled in and filled in. If you look around, if you look around what's happening around Ashoka, you can see it happening in real time. Right. And so the sample that I'll be talking about is what's happening in these little, little urban clusters. So I want to start with just a very simple um, uh, graph of the kind of data that we're picking up. So in 2011, you get a sense of, in the red bars, what ownership in India looked like in urban India. In our sample, you get a sense of what things now look like in the national capital region. I want to just point out one thing, because we don't have much time. This washing machine. So for people who study creation of the middle class, the washing machine is a very important good. It's often used as this good to char characterize which household has reached middle class status. What's interesting is by this metric, the median household in the national capital region, not just Delhi, but we're talking out in Meerut, out in Alwar, out in Bharatpur, is now in the middle class. And what we want to start doing is taking this data, using spatial information, and trying to understand at the scale of the city, at the scale of national capital region, what does economic well-being look like? So what I've done is I've taken these sets of goods and many more and created essentially an index that ranks people from zero to 100. It's a percentile value. Zero means you are the poor, poorest person in the population. 100 means you are the wealthiest person in the population. And the question I have is, how much does identity, religion, caste matter as opposed to other urban processes that are taking place to, to sort of change our world? This is a very standard question and something we don't have any data for. And the reason why it's particularly important in India is that if you ever go to an Indian village, what you'll notice is that where you live in the village, your neighborhood is completely determined by your caste and your religion. So this is a question I can't even ask in a village. This is only a question you can ask in an Indian city because identity and space are not perfectly aligned, right? And so what we want to know is how is urban space sort of changing the way that we think about economic inequality, economic distribution. So here's just a simple um, plot I have of large identity-based categories. I can also do this for Hindus and Muslims. General caste Hindus, the median person is at, at about the 64th percentile of wealth. And uh, scheduled castes are down to, let's say, the 40th percentile. So you can sort of see this. Now, when I put this on a map, you can see that the blues are essentially 25th percentile and below, and the reds are effectively 75th percentile and above. And you can see they're right next to each other. If you look back at these numbers, they're not anywhere near as stark as the kinds of numbers that we're seeing on the graph. We're seeing a lot more spatial clustering, poor next to rich. This is something about the labor market. If you ask me a question about it, I can tell you about it later. But what it's saying is that 
we are moving beyond just simple identity as characterizing where you live and, and your wealth and saying something about urban processes and proximity of rich and poor. So I want to sort of end with this simple idea. You can see that we have very poor clusters next to very rich clusters. And I run a survey where we're actually asking a lot of questions about gender attitudes, about economic attitudes, about social mobility. The question we have, if you're from a really poor area and you're next to a really rich area, the kinds of opportunities you didn't have in an Indian village, are things going to change for you now that you're in the national capital region? Thanks. Thanks.